Lakes <laughs> like family, guess what? Next week we get to meet together. Yeah, as long as the regulations don't change, we're meeting here. So 10 a.m. next Sunday morning. And stay tuned this week because we're going to try to find a way to make sure we register before we come. So Rob will share more about that later this week. Is that it, guys? Yeah. Let's get ready to worship together. Hello. Good morning, North Lakes. Um, we want to welcome you again to this uh, Sunday of worship. And um, hey, it's, it's, it's very much different from what we, we used to. But then um, God is so good. I think God has been preparing us all. And um, one of these things like, like this, um, we feel it's, it's so different. We missed you guys here <laughs> in this building. But then, um, yeah, God said that um, we can still worship Him no matter what. So today, um, the worship team will just want to uh, encourage you all to join us. And um, whether you're in your house and in your lounge and um, maybe having coffee or tea or, <laughs> or nibbles or something else. But we can worship our God all together in spirit and in truth. Amen? Amen. 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 Let's worship Him today.
morning, North Lakes. We are so glad that you're joining us this morning, and we're sorry that you have to do that online, but next week we will be together. And uh, yeah, look out, as uh, Marilyn said this morning, look out for the update on how you can join us next week. We're going to have some ways that you can tell us that you're coming. Um, and so uh, make sure you check your emails and uh, check the Facebook group so we can do that. Our time around the table this morning, that song couldn't have been a better song um, to introduce our time around the table because really this table that we have today is a celebration of, of love. It's a celebration of how God feels towards us. And we're not God, so it's hard for us to kind of put ourselves in His shoes. But we do know what love is, and I I'm sure all of you out there uh, have relationships in your life that you would consider and say, I am in love with that person, whether it's a husband and wife or siblings, family, uh, even a pet. We all know that feeling of love, and we all know what it feels like to have that love crushed or disappointed or um, not reciprocated to us. Uh, we all have that those times in our life where we feel like, wow, uh, I thought that person loved me, and they don't, or they've done something to disappoint us. Uh, they've done something that they, we thought we, they'd never do. And sometimes we think that God doesn't understand that. But if you look at the picture of Jesus in the Bible when he was under trial and he uh, was feeling isolated and alone and all these people had, were uh, telling him these things that, that he was accused of that he didn't do, um, well, those closest around him, those ones who loved him, they abandoned him. And there's a picture in the Bible where it, it shows us this picture of how Jesus is being uh, brought up in front of all these people and they're accusing him of all those things. And he looks out into the courtyard and he comes face to face with Peter. Uh, one of uh, the disciples, one of his followers that it says in the Bible, one of his followers whom he loved. And he was crushed that someone who uh, supposedly loved him would betray him and would, would uh, tell people out in the corner that they didn't even know him. And so um, I think we all know what that feels like, and I know Jesus knows what that feels like. Um, so just put yourself in that kind of emotional spot right now, that idea of somebody does something that you thought loved you that, and they disappointed you, but yet where does it go from, where does it go from there? Um, we see after, even after Jesus was resurrected from the dead, that he has another encounter with Peter later on. And I would just want to read from John 21, uh, just two verses, verse 7 and 8. And it says, The disciple, therefore, who Jesus loved, said unto Peter, It is the Lord. So when Simon Peter heard that it was the Lord, they were out in a boat, in the sea, and they were they were not far off, about a hundred meters off the, the beach. And when he heard that it was the Lord, he pulled up his his coat around him, uh, and it says because he was he was naked, and he just jumped in the ocean. He didn't even wait for the boat to get to the ocean or to the to the beach, and he started swimming this hundred meter swim. I can imagine Peter um, swimming so fast to get into the presence of the Lord, and. Why do you think he was motivated to do that? Well, I think he was motivated to, to get in contact with Jesus once again because he knew how disappointed Jesus was in him and he wanted to, to repair that relationship. And when he got to the beach, uh, I'm sure that they embraced and they sat down and had a breakfast meal together on the beach. Um, what a wonderful picture of reconciliation. What a wonderful picture of how Jesus, even though he was disappointed, accepted Peter back into his arms. And that's what we celebrate here at the Lord's table. We celebrate how Jesus, who I'm sure is disappointed by many of the things that we do, even though we love him, we disappoint him. But yet, continually, over and over, he welcomes us back with open arms, with a forgiving heart. And so that is what we celebrate, this idea that we can come to Jesus anytime. And every week here at North Lakes, we set 
aside time in our service to remember such a wonderful gift, a gift that God gives us freely. And so uh, I hope that you have some some uh, elements in your home, a cracker, and some juice that you can do. Um, so I hope that you can do that. Uh, and I hope that you'll be able to join with us today as we partake. And then next week we'll have a wonderful time uh, where we can remember Jesus together. Uh, let me pray and then you can do that. Hey God, thank you for today. Uh, and we appreciate so much your gift that you give to us. We appreciate just how much uh, that means to be able to know that we disappoint you on a regular basis, but yet you you lovingly and openly accept us back into your arms. And we're thankful for that gift. So we remember that gift today as we take of the cracker and the juice and help us to do that with honor and respect. It's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. So, uh, so uh, I don't know if some of you have been chatting or commenting. Uh, hopefully, you're able to uh, uh, encourage each other, chat with one another, uh, say hey to those uh, in the family of believers this morning, and just know that even though we're not like right next to each other, uh, we just miss uh, the time that we can have, and it's only one more week. So, hopefully, we'll get to see you in person next. Sunday right here uh, at North Lakes at the community center. So, and we'll have coffee and Nathan and Marie will be here and, and uh, doing all that good stuff. So, uh, and they have really cool, um, I just have to say this, there's this sign out there that's got like a picture of the coronavirus as a happy little guy who wants to give you a high five. <laughs> and now he spreads all over the world. And, and they're making like, so it's not scary for kids, but I just, it looks like an alien invasion. But, um, <clears throat> and actually that brings us to today's message. Um, I love sci-fi movies. One of my favorite movie series is Aliens. I mean, super creepy, uh, super scary and packed with thrills and twists uh, starring Sigourney Weaver, but uh, actually one of my other favorites is called John Carter, based on the book series by Edgar Rice Burroughs, The Princess of Mars. And uh, one of my favorite scenes uh, in that movie is when John Carter experiences the difference in gravity uh, on this new place and he's trying to figure out who he is and what to eat and, and these different species. And he was this true alien and stranger in a new world. Virginia. <laughs> Sorry. If you haven't seen it, you should come over to my house. We will watch it together. It's really great. Um, so today, in First Peter, we are actually going to see that we are chosen to be aliens. That's right, aliens. My daughter reminded me this week that Peter was talking 
uh, and writing to exiles. Uh, so the very first words of the book of this letter says, to God's elect exiles scattered throughout the provinces. Some translations use the word foreigners or immigrants or aliens or stranger. So <clears throat> today, I thought it might be worthwhile to take a moment and empathize with those who had to run away, those who fled their homes to escape the violence of the Jews and the Romans who sought to imprison them and kill anyone who followed Jesus. Just recently, we met a family in our neighborhood who were refugees from their learn a, a new language, new customs, new food, and a different way of life. It's difficult to feel out of place, like you don't fit in to be foreigners and strangers in a strange land. But that is exactly what we are called to be as followers of Christ. In 1 Peter, if you want to read with me, 1 Peter chapter 2, we're going to start in verse 11. He writes, Dear friends, I urge you as foreigners and exiles to abstain from sinful desires, which wage war against your soul. Live such good lives among the pagans that though they accuse you of doing wrong, they may see your good deeds and glorify God on the day he visits us. So Peter wants us to live like aliens, not of this world. So uh, <clears throat> there's this young man I read about who lived this out. Uh, at a young age, his country was invaded and uh, many were captured and transported as prisoners to be made as servants of he and his friends could be exempt from drinking that wine and eating that meat, perhaps. I don't know, maybe it was sacrificed to false gods or idols. Uh, but they asked if we, they could just drink water and eat vegetables. And so the guard in charge of the prisoners was afraid that, I don't know, if they turn out really weak and anemic from eating vegetables, that he would be the one that got in trouble. And so they asked him to just do a test, 10 days. If after 10 days we look really weak, then we'll start eating the king's food and wine. And if we look strong and healthy, then we can continue to eat vegetables and honor our God. And perhaps you know where this is going. After 10 days, when uh, the guard inspected Daniel and his friends, they were healthier than all the rest of the prisoners. And they were, continued to, they were allowed to continue to honor God in what they ate. Now fast forward a little bit. And uh, there was another time that king decided to build a golden image that everyone had to bow down and worship. And Daniel's friends, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, would not bow down to worship this false god. And so the king was enraged. He demanded, if you don't bow down to this image like I commanded, then I'm going to tie you up and throw you into the furnace. And that, this is what they told the king. King Nebuchadnezzar, we do not need to defend ourselves before you in this matter. If we are thrown into the blazing furnace, the God we serve is able to deliver us from it. And he will deliver us from your majesty's hand. But even if he does not, we want you to know, your majesty, that we will not serve your gods or worship the image of gold that you have set up. And so, if you know this story, when they didn't bow down, he had them tied up and thrown into the fire that was built seven times hotter than usual. And it was so hot that the soldiers that threw them in died from the heat. But a little bit later, the king looked in the flames and said, wait a minute, how many did we throw in? Three. Well, there's four walking around in the fire unharmed, and the form of the fourth one looks like 
an angel, or the son of a god. And he would be right. And so he called them out, and they walked out. And it was amazing because they were unharmed. There was not a hair of their head singed, and not even the smell of smoke on their clothes. And they were able to then worship the one true God. The king was so amazed, he called everyone to worship the one true God. Skip ahead just a little bit further, and Daniel finds himself serving a new king who's taken over the land. And uh, the enemies who are jealous of Daniel try to get him in trouble by convincing the king to make a law that only he should be the one that should be worshipped and that people should only pray to the king. And he's like, oh yeah, that's right. Everyone should pray to me. And so he makes this law, but Daniel does not change. He continues to pray to God three times a day in public view of everyone that would want to know and see. He worshiped his God. He prayed only to Jehovah God. And so they got him in trouble. And the punishment for disobeying this law was to be thrown into a den of hungry lions. Now, the king actually liked Daniel a lot, and he regretted making the law, and he, he tried to figure out a way around it, but at the time, there was no way to change the law of the Medes and Persians. And so he came to Daniel just before he throws Daniel in the lion's den, and he says, May the God who you serve continually rescue you. And sure enough, the next morning, when he came to check on Daniel, he was unharmed. The angel of the Lord had shut the mouth and the mouths of the lions so that they could not harm him. So if you need a little inspiration this week for your faith, to be bold, to stand up for what's right and true, go read the first six chapters of Daniel, and, and this could really encourage you. But what I'd like to do is see how this story dovetails just perfectly with what First Peter and the letter of Peter is saying to Christians in the, the uh, situation that sometimes we find ourselves in. So first thing I want to point out is that we need to honor God and his word above any other authority in your culture, in your government, no matter what the law is, first and foremost, we honor God and his word. If those two get along fine, great. But if there's a conflict, like Peter and John said, we have to obey God rather than men. And uh, maybe living in a free country like we are and worshiping however you believe, it may not seem like a big deal for us, but there are many places on earth where dictatorships and uh, regimes uh, force people to believe a certain way or punish them for worshiping Jesus as the God of the Bible. Daniel and his friends were captured, taken out of their homes, away from their families, and forced into this new culture. But could they find a way to stay true to their faith True to God? And the answer is yes, but it took a lot of boldness. It took a lot of faith. And uh, I think if it were us, if it were me, we probably would just eat the food. <laughs> right? Try not to draw any negative attention. Just try to fit in. And I don't know that that was necessarily for us uh, uh, an issue because we don't have the same food you know, laws and things, but... For Daniel and his friends, it was better to die than to disobey God. We need to have that kind of conviction. Uh, I think sometimes we put our own comfort and fitting in as more important than honoring God. And that's something we probably should reconsider and reevaluate. And I understand uh, like being proud of where you live. And, and I think it's okay to be proud to be an American or, or proud to be an Australian, right? 
But just remember, honoring God first is what we're called to. So you're a Christian first and then an Australian. Uh, you're a Christian first and then a Novocastrian or a Knights fan. <laughs> Some of you out there, right? Um, sometimes we are tempted to identify with what we do as our identity, like our job skills. Uh, when someone asks who you are, sometimes they ask, what do you do? And that becomes your identity. And so you might say, well, I'm a nurse <laughs> or I'm an engineer uh, or I'm a doctor. And uh, others, they might think that their identity is wrapped up in their ethnicity or their race. Like I am a white male or I am a black woman or I'm an Asian Latino, depending on who your parents are, right? <laughs> Um, and so all of those things may be true about you, but if you're a follower of Jesus, those are secondary to your desire to honor God and follow Jesus first. It's reflected in our priorities, in our values, how we treat people. So instead of being a doctor who happens to go to church, you are a Christian who performs surgeries to help people as a way to make a living. But first, you're a Christian. Uh, so even the, the top person in the land, the prime, if you're a prime minister, you don't just happen to be a Christian, but rather you're a Christian first, and then as a prime minister, those values and beliefs shape how you do your job and make decisions for your country. And, uh, and I'm... I'm actually glad for the one we have. He seems to be doing a really good job. Um, I know some of you are athletic. And instead of being an athlete who sometimes comes to youth group, perhaps you need to be a Christian. And then everything you do and all your influence points back to Jesus. How you work as an a athlete on your team. How you treat your teammates. The influence you have on those who are looking up to you. All those things play into it. Does that make sense? Your identity in Christ determines how you use your skills and talents to worship Jesus. And so, number one, we honor God first, no matter what. The second principle we can get from this is notice that Daniel and his friends always do their best job, their best work. It's excellent. You'll always see them getting promoted to the top. They're always in the top three, <laughs> top four uh, in the land because they have been promoted because they do a good job. And even though they are serving a ungodly pagan king, you catch that, you might have a boss or an employer who you don't like and who doesn't treat you very well. And yet, you still do your job the best you can, and you do uh, what you do to represent Christ however you can. The uh, guys who got transported over to Babylon, they could have been bitter. They could have been angry. They could have been rebellious. They could have tried to undermine the king. They could have tried to escape all of those things, holding a grudge for the things that, that had happened to them. But instead, they honored God by doing the best job that they were given. In fact, God himself brought about the captivity. It was his plan in order to bring about, eventually, a Messiah, Jesus. So this was his timing and his plan of how this was going to happen. And that Jesus would be born and raised coming out of that history. So take a look at yourself in your own situation. There are times that don't make sense, that you feel like you're going into captivity. Things are not going well for your family or for at work or whatever. Maybe, maybe things uh, even in the, with the coronavirus going around, you wonder, God, are you still with me? Are you still, what's going on here? But how we react to it is the key. We have to reflect Christ in our character, in the way we do our jobs, in how we treat our coworkers, how we talk about our boss, 
and how even at home, I mean, how you do your chores. How do you treat each other? How do you speak to one another? Uh, does it reflect Christ in the way that you serve one another at home? Ephesians chapter 2 verse 10 says this, For we are God's handiwork, created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance for you to do, for us to do. And I think it's worth pointing out that Daniel and his friends weren't out to evangelize and make everyone believe in their God, but because of the way they live their life and their bold faith, Listen to what happened. First in Jan Daniel chapter three, Nebuchadnezzar then said, praise be to the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego who has sent his angel and rescued his servants. They trusted in him and defied the king's command and were willing to give up their lives rather than serve or worship any God except their own God. Therefore, I decree that the people of any nation or language who say anything against the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego will be cut into pieces and their houses be turned into rubble. For no other God can save in this way. That wouldn't have happened unless they had stood up and had faith and boldness to represent God in that culture, in that country. It's kind of cool. They weren't out to evangelize anybody, but who knows how many people turned to the Lord and turned to recognize Jehovah as the one true God because of their faith. And then later, the same thing with King Darius and Daniel. After he's rescued from the lion's den, he said, King Darius declares, I issue a decree that every part of my kingdom, people must fear and reverence the God of Daniel. For he is the living God. He endures forever. His kingdom will not be destroyed. His dominion will never end. He rescues and he saves. He performs signs and wonders in the heavens and on the earth. He has rescued Daniel from the power of the lions. And in the same way, Peter recognized that if you live for Jesus, faithful no matter what happens to you, no matter what anyone thinks of you or what they do, people will end up glorifying God. Now the last principle, but it's not the least, is this. This world is not our home. Can I get an amen? amen. <laughs> we are not going to be stuck in this uh, fallen, sinful existence forever. Praise God. We should not get comfortable here and think that everything we do is about building our wealth and our comfort in this lifetime. It needs to be about something more because Hebrews chapter 11, verse 9 and 10 says, By faith Abraham made his home in the promised land like a stranger in a foreign country. He lived in tents, as did Isaac and Jacob, who were heirs with him of the same promise. For he was looking forward to the city whose foundations, whose architect and builder is God. And that's heaven. For me, home is kind of a safe place. Uh, it, it isn't for everyone, I know. But I'd like to be in my safe place, maybe in the backyard looking at the trees and birds. And because of our sin, sometimes that messes up uh, this home we have here on earth. And we are very aware of our own faults. Uh, we get into uncomfortable conflicts with people at work or even in our family. And I think it's just a reminder, this is not our home. I think we should be uncomfortable because of sin, because of the things that we see that pull against us. And, uh, and I know I feel closest to God when I'm in nature, in the beautiful places like the mountains or the ocean or in the woods, listening to all the animals and the birds. And uh, other times it's like when I'm here 
and I'm lifting up my voice in praise to God with brothers and sisters in Christ. That's why I'm looking so forward to next week. It's, it's just different than when you're sitting on your couch uh, listening to yourself sing or maybe even awkwardly not singing, just <laughs> watching Joel and Emily. Um, so some people feel close to God maybe when they're serving and helping others, uh, some by spending time in prayer or journaling. But whatever is that moment for you, I want you to just picture that moment that you step into eternity, that you step into heaven, the presence of God. And I want you to think of this. Live your life here with Jesus in such a way that when you enter heaven, it feels like coming home. It feels like a family reunion. It feels like a safe space. For now, Peter recognizes that the believers he is writing to are literally, literally foreigners and exiles because they're running away from Rome, they're running away from the Jews just to stay alive. And like Daniel, they and we need to remember who we are. And Peter says to live in such a way that people can see that we are different, that we don't belong, that we don't fit in because of the way we live. In John chapter 17, verse 14 and through 16, Jesus said, I have given them your word and the world has hated them for they are not of the world any more than I am of the world. My prayer is not that you take them out of the world, but that you protect them from the evil one. They are not of this world, even as I am not of it. And just to be clear, Jesus, when he says the word world, he's not talking about the planet. And he's not even talking about specific people. It is a general term referring to a mindset that is not godly. A, a selfish, focused culture that is ungodly. Someone who is not world, worldly, or someone who is worldly rather, is someone who is not concerned with eternity, not concerned with truth, and is not one who has a mindset focused on what God wants. Rather, they are just thinking about what they want and how they can get what they want as fast as they can. And that is the world we live in. This world is not our home. Keep that in mind. And I've noticed more and more that Christians, we have to be careful what we say and how we say it. We're so easily misunderstood or the words are twisted in such a way that it's not what we intended. Uh, Paul told Timothy this, there will come a time when people will not tolerate sound teaching, but they will surround themselves with teachers who will say what they want to hear. I believe we're living in one of those times. Jesus says not to be surprised if the world hates you because it's always hated the truth and it's always hated anyone who tries to hold up God's word as the judge between what is right and what is wrong. So the careful thing we have to do is to make sure that we're not hated because we're being jerks about it. I hope that makes sense. Uh, we don't want to be hated because we're being unkind or hateful or self-righteous and arrogant, but rather, like Peter says in the next chapter, um, when we do share our faith, it needs to be with gentleness and respect. And that is is the challenge sometimes because it's so easy to get into some debate on social media or uh, a fight with someone uh, verbally and it just goes nowhere. It does no one any good. And so what is Peter's answer to living in a culture that is hostile to Christianity? As the contemporary English version puts it, verse 12, live honorably among the unbelievers. Today they defame you as if you're doing evil, but in the day when God visits us to judge, 
they will glorify him because they have observed your good deeds. The NIV puts it this way. Live such good lives among the pagans that though they accuse you of doing wrong, they may see your good deeds and glorify God on the day he visits us. So today, remember who you are. Exiles, foreigners, strangers in this world, in this land. And because that's true, first, we honor God. He's the king of the country that we belong to, that we're a citizen of. So uh, his word is above any other opinion or law or authority. And so we do our best to follow Jesus no matter what anyone else says. Second, honor God by living such good lives. Do excellent work. Look for opportunities to do your best as you follow Jesus and that will actually be attractive as people see your life, as you do good deeds. And so thirdly, we remember that this world is not our home, so don't get comfortable. Today, this week, take intentional steps on this journey we are on together with Jesus so that one day when we enter heaven, it'll be like coming home. Would you pray with me? Father God, thank you so much that you have invited us to be a part of your family, that you love us so much that you gave your son to die on the cross for our sins. God, we thank you that we have the opportunity to worship freely and to hear your word. God, help us not to forget it, but to move forward this week in such a way, uh, living out a life of love and worship and give us opportunities to be bold and, and to be kind uh, in a way that shares our belief in Jesus, our relationship with your son, Jesus. And God, I ask that you would be with those who are really going through difficult times because it's, it's not easy to hold on to our faith uh, when we're in pain, when we're suffering. And Peter knew that too. God, I, I pray that you'd help us to hear today that you have not left us alone but you have made a way for us. God, help us to hold on to that and help us to know that you are preparing a place for us, that this is not our home. God, thank you for your son, Jesus. Thank you for the Holy Spirit that gives us the strength to, to make it each day. And we pray in Jesus' name, amen. amen. See you next week.